Gilgis Alexander. McCollum staying with him. Spins, gets inside. Left handed off the glass. Oh, what a sweet move. Giddy, tough spot. Back door. What a pass. What a play. And J Dub picks the pocket of Trey Young. He'll take it himself. This is Dart. You're listening to the Uncontested. What is up and welcome to the Uncontested Podcast. Coming to you live Sunday, March 31st as the Thunder escape Madison Square Garden with a 113 to 112 win over the New York Knicks in a game that should not have given me this much anxiety on Easter Sunday. But folks, here we are. I might smoke a cigarette live on the show. I'm your host for the evening, Jacob Niffin. With me tonight, I got my guy, Nick Crane. What to do? And we've got Taylor Peterson. Giddy, 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 giddy. Triple, double, triple, double, triple, double. Beautiful. There you go. People got what they wanted. I love it. We are brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network and the fine folks over at Social Order. They are the ones that are running Dave's Hot Chicken and Spark OKC. Speaking of Dave's Hot Chicken, we are now on the clock, folks. It is game week. We are five days away from the Uncontested's official watch party at Dave's Hot Chicken in Bricktown, Oklahoma City. Come out Friday night, April 5th, as the Thunder take on the Indiana Pacers at 6 p.m. We will be hanging out at Dave's Hot Chicken, eating great food, hanging out with all of you guys. We may have some food specials, may have some giveaways. We got some little uh, prizes, some little... uh, uh, party favors, I guess you could say. I don't know. Oh, man. So, man. Watch party some, getting crazy. Some cool little things. We got some stickers to give away. We may give away some other prizes as well. And we're just going to take over days. We're going to take over Bricktown. We're going to watch the Thunder beat the Indiana Pacers, get revenge. We're going to eat some absolutely wonderful food. And we're going to live pod afterwards. So please make your plans. Come hang out with us Friday night, April 5th, 6 p.m. at Dave's Hot Chicken in Bricktown. What else was I going to say? Thank you for tuning in the live stream. There's already a ton of people here. If you're watching the live stream, hit the like button on YouTube. That would mean a lot. If you're watching the YouTube video later on in the week, still hit the like button. And for all my podcast folks out there who download the show on their podcast app like me, Spoiler alert, I'm not a big like YouTube podcast guy. I don't watch the shows on YouTube. I just listen to them on the podcast app. So if you are like me and you do that, please make sure you drop the five-star rating on the show. The comments are pouring in. Keep them coming. Unless you're bullying me with bald <laughs> jokes, then stop them immediately. <laughs> Already, Nick, in the chat, we got a super. Will you bring that one up? For yeah. Yeah. Let's go. El Sombra Reggio, seven. My key moment of the game was actually Gordon's three and quick transition dunk. He scored points during the gaps. The Knicks were on high runs. Ooh, I love that. Because I did not have that in my notes, and I think that's a fantastic point. Gordon was critical there in that third. Someone found something that wasn't in your 18 pages of notes. For this I know. Pod. No, <laughs> it's, it's, a good, it's a good point. I think that's something that we should consider like more broadly is – um, and we're guilty of this too, like looking at box scores, like, oh, this guy was two of five from three. And Casey Wallace is a great example of this too, where tonight, I think he was what, two of three from the floor. But like the two shots he made were in big moments as well. And so that's the reason you can't box score watch is because there's a lot more to the shots that went in or didn't go in than the box score can present to you. Totally agree. A good week for Gordon Hayward. I'd say. Huh. That's weird coming out of your mouth. <laughs> Why <laughs> you say that? I think it was a week ago <laughs> that you said you were completely out on Gordon Hayward. Hey. <laughs> things change. Man. I am back in. Speaking of being out on things, before we dive in, oh dear. We're talking about this post game. We gotta put Taylor on the spot, Nick. Taylor, who knighted himself, quote. The giddy hater of the podcast. Technically, hey, I was hey, uh, knighted hey, that by hey, others. Hey, <laughs> Taylor, the apology needs to be as loud as the disrespect, my man. Let's hear it. 
<coughs> I got to be very thorough there so I don't have another spit take live on the podcast. <laughs> My dearest Joshua Giddy, I hope this letter finds you well. I am writing to apologize for my recent actions, including uh, poo-pooing you on the podcast over the majority of the first 50 games or so of the season. I deeply regret my actions and understand the impact that they may have had on you. And as a fan of the Oklahoma City Thunder and a supporter of your career, I realize that my behavior was not in line with the respect and admiration I have for you as a player and as a person. Please note this incident does not reflect my true feelings or intentions. I'm committed to learning from this experience and ensuring that does not happen again in the future. Once again, I apologize for any inconvenience or discomfort my actions may have caused you or your career. Thank you for your understanding. Sincerely, co-host of the Uncontested Podcast, Taylor Peterson. Um, yeah, obviously that was created by ChatGPT. However, uh, it was sent to me by our good friend, Carrie. I think the biggest thing I want to talk about is just the how most awesome insincere. Po- apo- you just read an apology letter and then you said, I didn't mean any well, of it. Yeah, I had what the hell? I had to do something funny. I couldn't just come up here and be like, here's all Josh's stats recently. He's been so great, which is what but you do have those probably. <laughs> Correct. Which is why Nick came in the clutch at the last minute before we jumped on the podcast and sent me uh, what I was calculating. Josh has been awesome, especially since Shay's been out. I understand it's only been a couple of games. Uh, but the entire March, of, the entire March, the entire month of March, looking at Giddy, 16.3 points, six, let's see, he is shooting 57% from the floor, 41% from three, which is just absolutely insane. Uh, obviously, we know what he's doing on the, the he's seven rebounds. Um, he's even getting steals. He had two steals, I believe, tonight, two blocks. Just absolutely fantastic from Josh in the, in the month of March, but I think that kind of came to a head here over this past week. Like I mentioned, no Shea and Josh just seemed to find a whole new level. Um, in his last five games, he's averaging 22.8 points per game, nine rebounds per game, 7.4 assists per game. But I had to do this quickly right before the podcast. Hopefully it's accurate, uh, but it's very close. And his last five is averaging 57% from the floor. Obviously we know the stats. Everybody saw the stat from tonight that he's one of like three players to ever have, uh, three triple doubles and three games at Madison Square Garden. Loves playing in the garden. But the biggest thing for me is something we've talked so much about with Josh throughout the majority of the season. It's just his confidence. And that, I, I, I think, really stood out to me there in that fourth quarter. Obviously, Dub was cooking. We're going to talk a lot about J-Dub. But Giddy driving to the rim like that, finishing around the rim through contact, hitting his floaters. I, I saw this stat earlier this weekend. I wish I would have saved it, but just – the increase in his percentages um, from in the mid range and around the rim. It's just so much better. The confidence is just back. Obviously there's some off court uh, things that uh, probably could have affected that earlier in the season, but ultimately it's just him finding his foot again. And the biggest thing for me, I think after this past week was seeing how that was going to look when Shay was back on the floor. Obviously Shay was not 100% tonight, um, but to see Josh be able to take over and kind of take that lead there alongside dub just incredibly exciting. And, and I really liked what we saw from Josh in the first half when he wasn't scoring even. I, I thought that's kind of what we can, once he's healthy again, impact to have, you know. so that's my true apology uh, and just showing my excitement for how Josh has been playing recently down the stretch. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it boils down to confidence, right? Like there's a lot of things that go into the confidence of a player and that's, that's, a real thing in all sports like there's like we, we've seen elite athletes have mental blocks like Andrew Luck one of the greatest quarterbacks of our lifetime who cut his career short like couldn't throw a football who and he's a quarterback because he had a mental block like the mental side of the game and the confidence side of the game is like never talked about enough or, or treated with enough sincerity as it should and it just goes to show like when when you get a little bit of confidence you can run with it like all of a sudden, the floater that he hit for two years before this season is falling. Um, obviously, the three is an anomaly. Like No one expects it to continue dropping at a 50-plus percent clip. Um, but when you're starting to hit shots and like the spin move and the finishes, like that's that's Josh's game. That's what we've seen for two years. And it, it to me, like there's, there's 15 factors that go into his performance, but it all boils down to those 15 factors impacting his confidence. Yeah, I, he had a quote after the Phoenix game the other night where he basically said that a couple months ago, the night before a game where he knew the other team would put a big on him, 
he'd stay up all night. Like it made him anxious. It stressed him out. And I'm paraphrasing here. I don't know what the exact quote was. And I'm paraphrasing to make it sound cooler. <laughs> but he said something like, now I can't wait because if you put a big on me, I'm going to bust your ass. And I freaking love it. And Direct tonight, quote there. Direct quote. <laughs> he had, I mean, in the fourth quarter, he hit two plays in a row, like just this disgusting, like just driving hard to the rim, put his shoulder in DiVincenzo and hit that spin move layup. Is just beautiful stuff. So we've talked a lot of Giddy. Let's let's get a little deeper into this crazy 113, 112 Knicks game. Uh since it is the Knicks game, Nick has to kind of lead us <laughs> off here. What's your big takeaway? Uh the the headline of the game, Nick. Ooh. Um I'll start us off gloomy because I know you guys will pick us back up here. Um there's a lot of games that you win that you shouldn't, that you're like, you know, you'll take the win. It's all right. This is one of those games where it just felt gross. Like it's a, it's a W in the win column. That's literally all that matters, whether it's a, a game you shouldn't have won or a game you won by 40. Um, I think my takeaway is the lack of attention to detail and the lack of assertiveness is, will cost them tremendously in the future. If they keep playing like that on the stretch, like, I'm not just talking like the missed free throws. There was so many opportunities to put the game away by simply securing a rebound and mm -hmm. just getting bumped off your spot or or the rebounds in your hand and someone hits you from behind softly and it goes out of bounds off of you. Oh, it's a foul. This is physical basketball. We, we've seen the game change the way it's officiated since the All-Star break. Oklahoma City, I think, although they've won a lot of games since then, have struggled with that change. We talk about offensively. Um, but like overall with just the, the physicality of the game, my takeaway is that can't continue in the playoffs and something's got to change on that front, irrespective of the outcome tonight. I, I think that's totally fair. Um, I think this team can play physical. I think tonight was one of those nights where play devil's advocate here real quick, Nick. Um, a lot of the little attention to detail things, the, I mean, you're right. It was a slog. I think the only part of the game that wasn't the slog was the first four to five minutes of the fourth quarter. So they really, really found a rhythm. The rest of the game uh, was like watching people play basketball like in a mud field during a rainstorm. Like it was just <laughs> disgusting. Like it was, it was a slog. A lot of things didn't go right, yet they still found a way to win the game. I think it's like, the the silver lining glass half full thing to look at here. Um, the free throws were atrocious. When you box score watch and you see the rebounds, the rebounds don't seem bad, but it was the timing of the bad rebounding that really got to them. Uh, free throws stick out to me heavy in this one. Uh, if you shoot anywhere close to your season average on, sorry, I said rebounds, free throws. If you shoot anywhere close to your average season average on free throws, um, you're not worrying about Shea hitting a bucket at the end of the game and then stopping Brunson from hitting a bucket. This game is done with three minutes to go because Correct. they're up eight or nine points. Agreed. Quick question That's, before, before you go, Taylor. Um, yeah. For both of you, do you feel of late, um, and I'm not saying this to say that the team has like taken their foot off the gas because they, they certainly have not. But do you feel there has been a bit of a drop off, whether it's because of um, the, the grind of the season is is affecting them or um, thinking about the playoffs, like whatever the reasoning is, do you feel that recently this team has not been as crisp as it was all season long to get them to this point? I would say I, yes. I say 110%. And I, I also kind of wonder if you ask 29 other fan bases, I think I don't think all 29 say yes, but I think that's probably the majority. A theme yeah, for every Mavs fans are not saying yes. Uh, Rockets fans are not saying yes, but just about everybody else is. Yeah. It, it's a grind at this time of the season. I've been thinking about that, Nick. That very same question because I see a lot of Thunder fans saying, "Well, this team's so young; they're supposed to have fresh legs, and you know they should be running around these older teams who are going through this slog of March, if you want to call it that." But ultimately, this is Chet's first season doing this. Uh, Dub and Shea, this is 
kind of their second time, but really their first time and, and play off meaningful basketball down the stretch in March that they're going through this. It takes a toll on the body. We obviously are seeing that with Shea and we'll get into Shea as well. Um, but I definitely don't think they're playing their best basketball, which maybe is exciting to your point that they've been able to respond in that way. Keep saying that this team is just so great at responding to adversity. And that's what we saw yet again tonight. And I actually, my first takeaway, just because I know we're going to talk about the low hanging fruit and the guys that performed so well tonight, but it kind of piggybacks off what you were mentioning, Nick, uh, obviously. And, and Jacob also mentioned this, the Thunder shot 44% from three, ultimately, which ended up being pretty solid. Uh, <laughs> a lot of that was inflated towards the end of the game in that second half shot, obviously. Oh, wait, no, sorry. I'm looking at the Pelicans box score. I was oh, going to say, that doesn't sound goodness. right because I was doing Josh Giddy calculations. Okay, Thunder Knicks, we are back. Sorry, quick aside. 38.2% from three, which makes a lot more sense than what I was expecting. Only 50% from the free throw line, 12 of 24. And so I pulled up the season averages for the Thunder and wins. They're shooting 41% from the four and wins from three. And free throw percentages is 83.3%. So there's two ways you can take that. Obviously, the Thunder are not shooting at that clip, both from the free throw line and three-point percentages here during this stretch of March. They also were able to win an incredibly close game against a great, great basketball team with a, I would say, an MVP, MVP candidate in Jalen Brunson while shooting subpar from those season averages uh, when they're winning basketball games. And I, I just think that's, again, shows the resiliency of this basketball team. I just realized Miles McBride played 46 of 48 minutes tonight. Oh my gosh, I did not know that. That is, that is a <laughs> Tibbs. A, um, Tibbs. Thing to do. Is that a that's Bucks? Wild. Is that a is that a Bucks remix with Tibbs? It, it's me trying to like uh, mimic Tibbs and his voice, and I just I can't do it. Go smoke a carton and come back, and you'll probably get it just fine. Be um, right back. We've talked a lot about Josh Giddy. the the two heavy lifters for tonight for the Thunder by far. Uh, where Josh Giddy and then J Dub just had an absolutely absurd game. If he makes his free throws, it's like even more absurd. He's only four of eight from the free throw line, one of four from three, but still ended up 14 of 18 from the field, 33, four, eight assists, two steals, two blocks. Um, Nick, I don't know about you. Uh, Dub was the best player on the court tonight on for either team. I don't think you could argue anything else. I think you could argue Brunson because the Brunson minutes were like a plus 18 and the non Brunson were like a minus 13 for the Knicks. Um, but I, I would say like for the Thunder, absolutely, which is crazy to say with an MVP candidate on the same team. Um, especially given he did it late. He had 10 points in the fourth quarter. Um, super efficient, like hits huge shots. I don't know. J Dub is is the kind of guy that I think a lot of the league still hasn't seen play, or a lot of the the fan base around the league still hasn't seen play. A couple national TV games coming up. So if you are listening to this pod and you don't watch the Thunder regularly, please watch one of these upcoming national TV games because he is legitimately the type of player who would be the building block face of the franchise in like Washington. Without a doubt. Definitely. He He's was awesome. tonight was just a a special night from J Dub. He he really played incredible. I thought a couple guys who were kind of a little, maybe a little under the radar tonight. They didn't get the shine that Dub or Giddy uh, or even Shea to an extent got, uh, but were instrumental in the win. J. Will and Kenrich Williams. They were both huge, especially on another game. I understand Chet had a good game, a decent game against the Suns, but it's kind of struggled as of late. Similar to Shea, although for different reasons. Thought J. Will was just critical there in that second half, especially in the fourth quarter. Uh, I understand he had plenty of mistakes, especially there during that final stretch where he was missing rebounds. He was subbed in uh, when when... I'm going blank. Brunson was shooting free throws and, and missed a critical offensive rebound. He wasn't perfect by any means, but his impact was so much greater than Chet tonight. And he was a large reason that I thought the Thunder were able to go on that run the fourth quarter where Dubbin and 
uh, almost said Chet, Dub and Josh were able to kind of take over there. Obviously, Kenrich as well. Not a great like box or huge box score by any means, but just continues to be impactful. Seems like never is for what fitting. it's worth. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Seven two and typical one, but three of four from the field. I thought just did a ton of little things to help this team win tonight. Yeah, K- Kenrich is a guy that we we were pretty critical of um, the first four months of the season, and he's been really good of late. Like he's mm-hmm. yep. last couple of weeks, like right when you need him to be. I don't even know if I can tell you that is if you looked at his box scores, it looks any different because it may not, but it just feels like in the, in the right moment, it's kind of the theme of this pod is like the right play at the right moment, like in the biggest situation, it seems like Kenny just keeps doing it when it matters. Tonight was the, the block on one end, the three on the other that just like swung the game five points and was much needed. Definitely. I'd also add queso in there as well. It just, the only reason I do is because I think the play that really stands out to me or sorry, the sequence of plays that really stick out to me is there to start the fourth quarter. Dub got just a, another ridiculous tough jumper. I can't even remember who the defender was. It might have been David Chinzo, and he just drilled it over him. Uh, Queso gets a three-point shot. Dub gets a steal and saves it. Uh, Giddy saves it all bounds. Dub finds Kenrich for the fast-break basket to start the fourth. Three-point game, cut it to three. And the rest was kind of history there, not the stretch. Just, uh, yeah, those guys stepped up huge. And honestly, that's kind of why I thought I mean, Shea's not healthy. Maybe it's a good time to transition into Shea. I would have rather seen some of those guys close the game rather than Shea. And then, of course, I tweet that and Shea hits the game winner. <laughs> yeah, like when you look at the other three starters, Chet, Shea, and Dort combined uh, nine of... I'm trying to do quick math here. While you do that... Nine of 29? Dort got a shit whistle tonight. Like, that was just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, that was pretty bad. What? God, God is what? Got a shit whistle tonight. Oh, I also okay. heard it as got his shit whistled tonight. Oh, yes, I was and like, was what is that? No, 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 no. Got a. <laughs> well, um, he shot all five of his attempts from beyond the arc. So off- offensively, I don't know if a whistle had any impact on that. For but sure. Agreed on he, the of it. He, He's in Chet, the game, and Shea were 10 of 29 from the field. Like, that's not really typical. Uh, Chet's had. Chet's really been a roller coaster recently, like really bad against the Rockets. I thought really good against the Suns, mm-hmm. really bad here against the Knicks. So if the theme continues, he's going to ball out Tuesday night against the Philadelphia 76ers. We'll see. Um, but to have those guys have such a bad night and still come away with a win, like that's just the luxury this team has with, the insane amount of depth. Do you guys know who led the the Thunder in plus minus tonight? Josh Giddy. Probably the man top of my head. The man who saved basketball himself. Oh. Aaron Wiggins was a plus 13 tonight. And what made mistakes, Josh? I'll say. Like he's a guy that that was not perfect, but mm-hmm. was still awesome. Yeah. Uh Josh was a plus eleven. Aaron okay. Wiggins was on the floor for a big chunk of that fourth quarter run, which is I think where a lot of that plus comes from. Yeah. But he was awesome. Wiggins had 13 minutes to Hayward's 11. And I think that's probably fair moving forward. I even would like to see a little more Wiggins selfishly, but um, that 11 was 11 guys team. in the rotation tonight. I could see them playing those 11 guys in the playoffs like yeah. every yeah. night. The only two that didn't play are the two that uh, were the centers the team was or that the fan base is calling for. Uh-huh. Uh, I think the, the other thing to, to pile onto Jacob's comment around the luxury of winning a game when some of your best players are not. Um, at their peak is that the two players that were not at their peak in Shea and Chet did not check into the game until like four minutes and change or five minutes and change left in this game. Mm-hmm. It and was four. That, that's, that's like half because they were not great and half because Mark trusts his dudes top to bottom. And if you're playing well, he's going to play you. That doesn't matter if you're uh, Aaron Wiggins playing over an MVP candidate, for example, in Shea. For, like it, it's 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 the philosophy that's gotten them there, playing unorthodox, going against the norm. I think that's going to continue in the playoffs again, like Jacob said. Speaking of that, Nick, let me ask you this: four point eight seconds left. Mm-hmm. The Knicks just got an offensive rebound and a bucket to go up one. Thunder call the timeout. Josh Giddy is inbounding the ball. I guess two two questions in one. Mm-hmm. A, do you think the play call was for Shea in the corner on the baseline? And B, if you were the coach in that situation, 
Is that what you have called, or who would you have drawn the play up for for the game winning bucket? Uh, I'll give you a cop out answer because I think it was a play that had probably three different options depending on what's open. It I think did. there was a I think there was a Joe uh ball screen top of the key curling off for a wing three. I think there was Shea where he grabbed it and kind of the like elevated dunker spot, kind of short corner turnaround jumper. Um, I imagine I didn't I haven't actually watched the playback. There's probably like a backside of the basket lob play. I, w- I would I would bet like maybe the screener for Joe rolled back door. I don't know. I haven't seen the play again. Um, so short answer is there's probably three options, but I would guarantee you if Mark was drawing on a clipboard, number one was Shea turnaround jumper because he's done that a lot of times. Like not not just like in the flow of a game, but also to win basketball games. Like that that True. shot is signature Shea game winner. To be clear. So one thing Shea wait, mentioned post game. Hold, hold on, hold on, real quick, because the first was, do you think the play was for Shea? The second is, is that what she would have run? Oh, God, I don't I mean. I'm not sure if the me, would I run a different play, play than, than the best ATO <laughs> yeah. coach in the <laughs> league, Jacob? Like what? What I'm, what I'm, I'm fishing sit on the for pod here is should it should it have been J Dub with the ball in his hands for oh, with the game okay, on the line? Okay. I see. You should just ask me straight up. Uh, <laughs> That's I knew what you were getting at. I don't know. Like may, maybe maybe there was an element of that play where if this guy uh, goes under a screen or Isaiah Joe gets doubled, that there's a there was probably a dub wrinkle in that play. Um, I still think as bad as Shea was tonight, he still went the ball in his hands. That's what happened. That's what works. There's probably an alternate reality where Deuce McBride plays better defense on Shea and, and uh, gets in a passing lane and avoids that entry pass to him in the short corner. And Dub does hit the shot. Like I think that's also an alternate reality. So no, I would not draw a different play than Mark. Uh, do I think Dub could have hit the game winner and deserved to get the game winner? Like, like to answer your question, if if Mark had drawn up a play for Dub, well deserved. I and think I'm, I'm, we got some people in the comments I haven't seen, but apparently in post game interviews today. Uh, Shay said that the that's play what was I was not about to say designed for him and I was interrupted. Sorry. Yeah, no. Well, technically didn't say it was designed for him, but he said if he knew if he went up and set a hard screen, he was going to be able to flash back to the corner and he was going to get a shot opportunity. So, yes, he alluded to that. He thought he would be a number one option. But I like what Nick mentioned, because when you run a play like that, you're not running that. Mark never calls an ATO for well, it, I shouldn't say never. In that instance, it wasn't designed for one specific player. If that Shea corner pass isn't open after the screen, like Nick said, Dub's able to flash to the ball and go ISO. Or you have Isaiah Joe coming off a pick for an open three, hopefully. And so to answer your question, Jacob, if I had to like, I wouldn't have called a different ATO, but if I had to prioritize who was getting the ball, it'd probably be Dub one, Isaiah Joe coming off a screen for three, number two, and then Shea number three just based off this past week knowing Shea's not fully healthy. Was that obviously wasn't the shot. case, and that's why I am not a head basketball coach. Yeah. Shot was badass. It was tough. Like, that's that's one of those that, if it misses, people outside of Oklahoma City are saying, that's the play you draw up. But people in Oklahoma City are like, yeah, that's the shot he makes all the time. Um, the, the, the baseline the midi is, especially the turnaround midi, that is his bread and butter. Like, and teams will give that one up. I mean, I, I think a lot of teams, especially in the playoffs, are going to be content with a, a contested Shea midi turnaround on the baseline. That thing's money, yeah. dude. I think that I think that that um, spinning, catching and spinning on that shoulder is his preferred. If I'm thinking correctly, like if he was if it was a two on the other side, I don't think that that shot would have well because then he's catching and turning and right foot is going into. It. I don't know. I think actually now that I'm now that I'm talking out loud, that shot is tougher in that short corner because you're turning over your opposite shoulder and fading versus catching on the dominant side, right foot pull up. That's that's a hard shot. That's a really yeah. hard shot. It was tough though. Yeah. T U F was tough. tough. Love it. Um, let's take our first break of the night. On the other side, we are going to hit uh, some hot takes. So, chat, if you have some hot takes, start getting them in the in the stream here now. Make sure to tag it with hot take. That way we can star it and bring it up. Actually, before we do that, though, Nick, I think we got another Supers comment. We got to read that before we move on. We do. Let me pull it up here. 
Um, hearing Nick's commentary bring up the giddy allegations felt icky. Um, I felt the same way, Kieran. Thanks for the the comment. I actually put that in the Slack. I was I always listen to the opposing team's broadcast when I watch games. Um, and it was a weird deal because it was like the timing was on a thunder run when you could tell the broadcast crew was like pulling for straws, something to like make it a Knicks comment or an anti thunder comment. And like Josh had just scored like six, seven straight points and they're like brought up the allegations off the court and then finished it with, but they never found anything from it. There was no actual evidence. That he did anything. And then just like dropped it. I was like, why, why bring it up? So, um, it did feel icky. I, I, I respect the Knicks broadcast crew. It's, it's a great broadcast crew, although they're very homerish. Uh, felt really wrong to bring that up in this game, especially when you close it off with, but they never found anything. Why bring it up? Then? Interesting. I was listening to the thunder broadcast. Thunder broadcast had, um, uh, why am I going blank on the radio? guy? Pinto, Matt Pinto. Pinto. I forget sometimes how petty Matt Pinto is. I kind of love it. He just takes little jabs throughout the entire game. It's just kind of incredible. Did he have any cha-chings? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the catchphrase. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I, we'll I, I be sure. right back on the other side. We are hitting our hot takes of the week. Stick around. And we are back uh, to do hot takes of the week. Before we do, though, we got to tell you about the East Hollywood pop-up sensation turned fast casual superstar Dave's Hot Chicken is now serving Oklahoma in Bricktown, Edmond, and soon to be in Chisholm Creek. I was actually up in Chisholm Creek this week. That restaurant is coming along very quickly, so it should be there very soon. Their mouth-watering sliders and tenders are offered at seven spice levels, ranging from no spice to reaper. And each piece of hand-breaded chicken is spiced to order using a blend crafted specifically for its heat level or no spice at all, along with sides of house-made kale slaw, creamy mac and cheese, and crispy seasoned fries. And make sure to try the new Dave's Nut Chicken, cauliflower slices that taste like Dave's Hot Chicken, but they're not. Visit Dave's Hot Chicken in Bricktown right next to Fuzzy's Taco Shop before or after the next Thunder home game. Or... Do it this Friday night, April 5th, when we host our watch party as a Thunder take on the Indiana Pacers in Indiana. Make sure to come out to Dave's Hot Chicken. Gentlemen, hot take of the week. Who wants to go first? Uh, it looks like he got, he's got one. I've got a few that I'm thinking about. Well, you think uh, I'll go first it. if you want. I oh, think Jacob's got it up as well. Good Here, grief. I'll go. go ahead then. <laughs> I will fire it up. I, I feel pretty strongly about this one this week. I kind of have a style of my hot takes. This is kind of breaking the mold a little bit. My hot take of the week. The 2023-2024 Thunder is the most fun Thunder team in the history of of Oklahoma City NBA basketball. You put that in our Slack this weekend, and I liked it. Uh, we're kind of prisoners of the moment right now. I'm never a prisoner. This America, I'm free. <laughs> I, I might give that like a... Maybe a medium. Can I can I give you some, some teams or moments on teams that maybe feel different or feel yeah. like competitive? Yeah. Um, there was many moments in Russell Westbrook's MVP campaign that felt like, mm -hmm. although the team was not very good, uh, there were some moments that were just like, we are witnessing some insane stuff. And 50 point triple doubles? Like, yeah, dude, insane. Uh, there was moments during Paul George's, like, he was third runner up for MVP that one year, and the like double crossover step back over KD. Like there, there were some moments that year, although it ended in a Dame waving. You remember goodbye. the floater yeah. over Rudy Gobert, the yes, game after yes, the all-star yes, break. Yes. Like there, there were some moments that season where I, I think you could probably say it, it rivaled. And then, I mean, the, the thing, the, the, the one reason I can't jump on your wagon here and agree is because we haven't seen anything in the playoffs and in the playoffs, 
stuff gets 10 times more fun. And especially, although it ended up being heartbreaking for Thunder fans, the Golden State 73 win season going up 3-1 in the Western Conference Finals. Like, you can't tell me that run in the moment, although it sucked when it ended, I'm sure. Uh, you can't tell me that wasn't just insane. That run was insane. That season sucked, though. That's sure, what sure, I sure. Yeah, but, that but, but, like, but we're not talking about like most fun game one to game, you know, Z. You're talking most fun Thunder teams. You're telling me in the playoffs of 2016 going on that run, you weren't sitting there saying this team is sick. Oh, when we got to the end of the regular season, I thought they were a, a first round out. And then I thought they went up 3 1 against the Warriors. And I legitimately thought they were going to win a title that yeah, year. Yeah. Um, this swing, I think just from, I don't know, from one to 82, the vibe of the team, like everything about this team, the, I think they might be my favorite, like the most fun Thunder team there's been. So you said you've disagreed, Nick. So where do you, where do you put it on the scale? I mean, I'm, I don't fully disagree. I'm just saying, I think there's other moments and there is like the, the, and this one's kind of TBD based on totally postseason. Agreed. Like you said. Agreed. Agreed. If, if they lose, if they lose in four games in round one, I think you're going to look back and be like, it was kind of fun. You know, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a medium to hot. That's fair. Okay. I took it a completely different way though. And I think the way you're thinking about Jacob is just the vibe of this team and the teammates and the barking after post games and how everyone's so close. The only reason I put it as a medium and maybe not a mile, just because I think about that 2012 NBA finals team, right? You had the Broingtons doing their, like their raps or whatever on YouTube. And like uh, this super young thunder team makes it all the way to the finals. This team has very similar vibes. So maybe if they're able to make a similar push here in the next season or two, I'll put them up there with that team. But just as a whole from like bottom to top of the roster, a lot of great characters and, and great people on this team. I think what makes it maybe more a hot than a medium for me, Jacob, is I don't want to like call it a fan base or a team. There's a lot of franchises out there that one good fun season is like the one good fun season over the last 10, 15 years. Oklahoma City, like you, you guys saw the Thunder PR tweet. It was like the 12th playoff appearance in the last 15 years. Um there's been a lot of fun teams. Yes. And that's that's the reason I think this might be more hot than medium is because this is just one of those unique franchises where there's been so many, not just fun, but like really damn good teams with a lot Successful, of yeah. Hall of Fame point. level We're a little spoiled, players. You say. Through. Totally. totally. <laughs> Very much I, so. Matt Noonan brings it up in the chat. Look at the Timberwolves. This is the best Timberwolves season. Like, literally... Maybe in Nick's lifetime. Uh, their second best was Jimmy Butler getting them like that. Le like they won the last game of the regular season to make the playoffs and then got uh -huh. bounced. Yeah. And that's, like, and that's it, probably their second best season. This is their best season. Yeah. Since Kevin Garnett was playing for the franchise. Yeah. Crazy. Like that's insane. The Kings. So for the, yeah. You think about the Kings, like, we are incredibly spoiled yeah. to have this level of success and this level of fun. That's what makes this one difficult is you have so many other seasons to choose from for the funnest season. This, I don't know. It's just been a vibe the whole year. It's, it's so much fun. I really quickly, I did see somebody in the comment mention like this. He disagreed with this take simply because it seems like thunder fans, especially on Twitter are so upset after losses. And I think that kind of goes back to what you all were saying about, us being a little spoiled as a, as a fan base. Like imagine having this team after missing like five straight seasons of the playoffs compared to missing three. Like the vibes are probably very different. We're a little spoiled. I think that kind of goes into the comment that was uh, I saw I, earlier in the chat. I enjoy being spoiled, folks. That's right. Continue spoiling. Continue to spoil me. us, Sam. You guys ever, I, I don't want to get us on our side. <laughs> you ever think about what happens when Sam Presti retires? It's like that's like one of those things like death where it makes me anxious. So I just try not to think about it. I just put my head in the sand. <laughs> I'll I'll give you a counter argument to maybe pull your head out of the sand a bit. It, it would be like in the moment, seemingly not detrimental, but like a big deal. Um, Sam seems like the guy that if and when not if he will retire someday or move teams when he's no longer in the position he is with Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, 
it might feel catastrophic, but there will be a story that comes out or um, a letter that he writes to the fan base or something. And we're going to realize that like whoever took his spot is going to be some in-house guy. That's been his shadow for the last five years and has learned the ins and outs and is going to be the next great GM. Like it's not, it's, it's, and then they turn out to be Troy Weaver. Sam, <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam is very much the kind of guy that I think if he is positioning an exit, he will be like training the, the, the next guy up. Like he, he's that kind of guy. He's, he's a, what is my legacy? What am I going to leave? And I think he's going to leave a phenomenal future GM. Nailed it. All right. Who's got another hot take? I'll give one. Uh, Jalen Williams, career high. Who knows it? It was mentioned tonight. It's against the team that they played tonight. His career high is against the Knicks. Is it 36? Uh, it's 36. I think Earlier this at... season at, at in OKC, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. In late December. I... I'm going to say that not only is he going to eclipse that career high, he will have his first 40 burger. Yes. Between now and the end of the regular season. I mean, I'm shit. You. Like tonight, he he got 33 on what, 18 shots? Imagine <laughs> the night the dude takes 25. Like that seems pretty damn easy. Do the math. And if we're hoping. <laughs> I thought he was going to get Shay to 40 can... tonight, Nick, honestly. Yeah. If we're hoping Shea continues to progress and get healthier, that's going to be harder and harder to do. I'll give you hot, but I Ooh, I'm going mildly. <laughs> I think he gets it. He's on a heater, dude. He did it tonight. He had what? Did he, what was his line tonight? Like 33. Did he have a 33 tonight? He was one of four from three. Imagine one yeah, night yeah. where he's cooking from three and takes like seven or eight of them. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. point. Man, there. I forget when it was maybe it was in the third quarter he had a play where he got i think he got brunson on him on a switch went right one dribble inside the three-point line and rose up and the form on the jumper and the backspin on the ball off the the wrist flick i was just like holy shit that's the prettiest jumper i've ever seen in my life like you need to slap an nsfw sticker on that thing and put it on the dark (laughs) web that was disgusting and when he gets in the groove like that, it's insane. It's insane. He's he's the dude. I'm I'm sure people kind of just think I'm an asshole for this or like annoying. But anytime he takes one dribble left, I always just say, Oh, pull up money before he even shoots it, because you know what's going in. If he gets to the left side of the lane, it's over. Absolutely. When he goes left. Over. Yep. I like that one, Nick. Taylor, what's your hot take of the week? My hot take last week was that I thought the Thunder should sit Shea because he didn't seem healthy, and sure enough, he was not, and that happened. I think this week, and I, I've seen all the discourse about they should continue to sit Shea through this road trip, etc. I think we see two straight 30-point games from Shea to end this week. The last two games of this week, he comes back into form, and we get 30-plus in two straight games. Kind of a mild take, but given the circumstances, Maybe a little spicy. Back to back thirty point games before the end of the week. Correct. Oh, buddy, uh, he had seventeen they, tonight. They, they play a back to back this week, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Celtics he ain't, he ain't and playing, Sixers. He ain't playing two nights in a back to back. I'll tell you that now. So uh, you're saying oh, that the next, you're saying the next two games he's scoring thirty. All right. Well, I'm gonna call that. Uh, Hot, boom, which is, which is weird to say because, like, yeah, Shea is, I'll like, go medium the because it's guy. Shea, yeah, Fair. but I, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear after watching him tonight. Like, he played, he's able to play through the pain, but he's still not, he's still not. Most guys are not to be clear at 100% at this point in the season, but he's not even, I don't think he's even 80 or 90, to be honest. That's kind of where my hot takes stem from, yeah. yeah. Also, go medium just because it's Shea, I think he can get. He's shown us enough times he can just get 30 that yeah I'm just gonna I'm just gonna roll with it Nick we have a ton of hot takes in the <laughs> chat do you mind reading some of them for us yeah I'm gonna run out of breath there's a lot of them <laughs> um, a lot. you don't gotta read them all choose like five or six of your favorites all right uh, I'll start with a really hot one in my opinion there's a couple that are kind of similar to this so I'll let you guys marinate on this hot take of the week from Ben Alpers 
the Thunder will finish 60 and 22, which according to my math means they will not lose again this season. <laughs> this one is extra hot. Correct. It's not, you're not quite. You're not Reaper. going Reaper. I could go Reaper. I think there's, I go Reaper on ones that have like 0% chance of happening. And you're literally just talking out of your ass. This one's like 95% out of the ass and then a little whisper out of the mouth. So for that, he gets an extra hot. <laughs> I'll tell you why it's Reaper for me. If the Thunder won their next... Wait, they have eight games left. Eight yeah? games now. Eight yep. games. If they won their next seven, I think they'd be in the driver's seat for number one. Um, oh, yeah. Their last two games are against the Bucks, who probably don't care. I, I think I think the Bucks will have two solidified by then. The Cavs would be sneaking up on them. Um, the Mavs are the last game of the season. I think the Mavs will have something to play for. So I'll have to say... If they go six and zero or seven and zero in the last two games, or Bucks, Mavs, and you're sitting everybody, they ain't winning that game when one or two of those teams are going to have something to play for. So, I'm going to go Reaper because not only do they have to like win out in the games that matter, but then also they're going to play the C team against teams that have something to play for. Look at Nick using logic while I'm over <laughs> here just rolling on vibes, going alone. off vibes. Jake There's also like the, back to the tough back to back two national TV games this week. Yeah. Back to back. Yep. Yep. Um, here's one that's kind of similar, but more immediate. Uh, George Goodwin says hot take of the week. Five and zero on the East Coast road trip. Um, mm -hmm. I know full well. Indy is not on the coast, but consider the entire trip East Coast an East an East trip, if you will. Uh, George thinks five and zero. I'm going to also give that an extra hop for the reason I just mentioned. National TV back-to-back -back games this week against the Sixers, which they can win, especially since they aren't fully healthy. But then the Celtics, arguably the best team in the league. I think that's just that's a, extra hot. The six, you're saying it's a back-to-back, -back, but only the Boston game is national TV. Is that correct? I thought the Sixers Sixers game was as well. Are they on national TV? Back ESPN back and then TNT or vice versa. Let I'm almost positive. Pull it up for you here. Per ESPN, they have... ESPN has none of the remaining games with the TV indication, so that their site must be... Busted. Micah says Sixers is on TNT. Okay, okay. I thought... And the... then Boston is on ESPN the next night. Wow. Told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's going yeah. to be tough. That's TNT going to be really tough. Tuesday, ESPN Wednesday. There we go. The Thunder's full site. Why was I going to ESPN when the, the Thunder have a site of their own? Um, <laughs> I think that's. I think that's still pretty hot. I think uh, they. I mean, we'll get to it in our predictions, but yeah. yeah. I playing, mean, if they, playing Sega if, Baba in Boston is pretty tough. If they go five and zero. Oh, and then they've only have three games left. Like that's that's just a hair below the finishing the season undefeated take. If they go five and zero on the on the road trip, like yeah, I don't give a shit what happens the, the rest of the four. Like <laughs> rest guys, whatever. But I'm yeah. going extra. Yep. Hard. Totally, totally. Uh, Sean says Andrew Luck is in a top twenty QB <laughs> of his lifetime. Sean, I, I, I don't know how old the... you are, but in my lifetime, he certainly is, and we can debate if you'd like to debate offline. Um. This one, it it continues to come up from three legged chair. And it's actually <laughs> three legged chair. interesting, <laughs> and I, I love the reference and the and the username here. Uh, <laughs> it's it's not it's crazy, but it's not crazy. This take, like, for the Thunder to make the finals is like extra hot. That's hard to do, but if you were to say, hey. Oklahoma City is in the finals. Game one's tomorrow. Let's pull up MVP odds. Like Josh is third or fourth on the Thunder, probably. Uh huh. Uh, that's not that hot. Like so. So I guess do you take this this hot take as like you have to consider the first the Thunder have to get there, and then he has. To let's the let's player. consider. Let's act like the Thunder are yeah. like you said about to start game one of the finals. Yeah. Josh Giddy finals MVP. I would put hot. So. For context, and Taylor, I'll let you give like the final answer. If if the finals ended up being a five game series, and the Thunder, what they've won, they've won four of the last five. Yeah, am I wrong? Mm -hmm. So let's say the last five games was was a series. Uh, I think Josh Giddy is Thunder MVP the last five games. Yeah, 
for sure. So it's it's like that's such a vacuum thing to say, but like it's not out of the question that this could be a hot take. But like, I think it's hot or extra hot for sure. If 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 they, I'm they're here, I'm going Reaper and not for the reason everybody probably thinks because I'm apparently the Josh Giddy hater. You you issued the apology, the completely yeah, I did your apology, and I think there's a conversation to be made. If Josh is playing like he has over the past week, even the month of March, and the Thunder win the finals, that there's a, a discourse within the fan base that he was the most impactful player for the Thunder. I think that's completely fair. But I've watched a lot of finals, watched, watched a lot of Super Bowls. Um, my Chiefs, <laughs> Patrick Mahomes always gets the finals MVP. Moving on. Even if he doesn't really need it, right? Or it, it doesn't deserve it all the time. I, I just, it always goes to one of the bigger players. And also, honestly, if Josh Giddy is the best player hands down for the Thunder in a finals matchup, I don't think the Thunder are winning the finals. It's going to have to be a balanced effort like we saw tonight. I think that's fair. Even if, even if they've gone, uh, had a really good record the last five games and he's been their best player. And I think that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like there's, there could be a healthy discourse amongst, amongst the fan base, but it's probably going to go to Shea for his resume or potentially dub if he's scoring 36. You remember when the, the LeBron lost in the finals and people still voted him for finals MVP. Yeah. And to be clear, he kind of deserved it. He yeah, carried that team. Insane. Yeah. Uh, next one is from Giorgio four, two, three, kind of similar. Um, said, been sitting on this for a while. Josh Giddy will have at least two playoff games. We can point to him and say we don't want without him. That light, light, mild. Yeah, maybe this, no sauce. This is a game, or this is a hot take that I think. I don't know, guys. Uh, six weeks ago, he might have said, I "Wouldn't be surprised if Josh didn't even play two games in the playoffs." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now it's like, yeah, you might be onto something. Do you think light, mild, light, mild. Oof. Let me hide this so I can see the scale again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's a I gotta, two. I gotta games, go right? mild for sure. That, that's fair. That's fair. I'm probably more light mild. And, and this, to be clear, if this isn't like saying this. that Josh Giddy is like the best player or wins the game for them, but you could very clearly say uh, they could not win without him. For sure. Just like tonight. Uh, Jacob, how many more do we go through? Give me, give me two, two more. Two more. Okay. Um, we also got some supers we got to read. Yep. Let's go with the super. Why people are just randomly giving us money on the internet is love it. <laughs> love stupid. It. <laughs> Alan says this team makes me happy, even though I lost a bet and on my friend Wingstop, but it's well worth it. Jade up to freaking stud and Giddy is killing it. Alan, kudos to you for paying for your friend's Wingstop, Wingstop and then paying us to talk Thunder basketball. That's Alan, right. Money. Uh, <laughs> Alan, if you'd like to DM me a Wingstop gift card, I would very much appreciate it. <laughs> um, no, but totally agree. J Dub is ridiculous. Josh Giddy is ridiculous. And, um, I would love nothing more than in July when we're starting to talk about the upcoming season, the 2024-25 season, for the conversation to stop being the trio of Dub Chet Shea and more like the quad of Dub Chet Shea. <laughs> Dub <laughs> Chet Shea Josh. And Giddy. Yeah. Because or even the that, team as a whole, a right? Like Kaysen stepping up like he has. Speaking of that, Nick, I think there. Let's do our last hot take. I think yeah. there was one about Josh getting an extension this summer. Is that right? Um, mm -hmm. let's find that one here. Or like or working his way into being a a big four instead of a big three, something like that. There's a there's literally four hundred and sixty something comments. So <laughs> I can't find that one. But okay, we'll just pick one more. Okay, now I want to talk about that one though, real quick while, while I'm looking. Um, okay. the, the Josh extension conversation. Um, I would say it's very likely that Josh gets extended. I don't think it's going to be a number that's like super high. Um, but I do think that Josh Giddy will get extended. He's assuming he keeps playing at even a halfway reasonable level where he's like a fourth or fifth option. He's worth keeping around. Um, we have two more supers here. Uh, David, let's just hit those. I can't, I can't answer this question because it's asking if you agree with me. Uh, do you agree with Nick that Shea has no chance in MVP at this point? Yes. I do too. He's not going to win. With it. the injury. Okay. The injury. It's the a poor very player, low. I, no chance is maybe a little bold, uh, but it's a very low chance. Yeah. He, he would have to like 
it, it would have to be one of those like storybook scenarios where like that it goes down to the wire of who gets the one seed and Shea has like 40, 50 point games. They'd have to go stretch. like seven more game winners yeah. the next yeah. seven. And like he'd have to average like 37, 12, and 12 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Last one here from Nick Jordan. Great name, Nick. Where do you think Shea <laughs> ranks amongst the Thunder greats? Oh, man. Currently, right now, three. It's not close. It's three in the KD. Yeah. It's I, hard to argue. I, I will say, uh, I how agree. high can Shea get? That's maybe a fun, a more fun he question. Could, he could be two by the summer if they win a title. That's a huge, massive. Does he have to win a title to get to two this summer? To pass Kevin, I think so. I'm almost more excited to talk about the Jade up. What about if, but that's if a pod he, for a different time. he finishes out this current contract, Nick signs another one in OKC or signs an extension on the current contract and the trajectory of the team is like what we think it will be, but let's not say they win or don't win a title. Let's leave the title away from it for now, but let's say he continues to be the player. We think he is for the next five to six years to his age 30 season. Mm-hmm. Where is he at? I think he's got a real case for two at that point because doing it through 30 is is a long time. I mean, um, if you win a championship, there's an argument. He's up there with Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, if, if he if wins Shea, a championship, I think he's won. I think if, yeah. Shea, if Shea wins a championship on this, on and frankly, any contract, he's the guy. Hey, we're going long. I want to quickly read this off, though, and lob it to Nick because this is something I haven't really talked a lot about on the podcast. I love Nick's player comp for Dub. That hasn't really been mentioned. Noah said, hot take, Jalen Williams' true future comparison is Paul George, multiple all-star, all-defense award winner. I like that one. I've heard Jimmy Butler. I think Sam Vecini is kind of uh, driving that train there. But, Nick, you had a player comp for Dub that I haven't heard a lot about, and I actually really, really like it as the season progresses. Do you want to throw that name out there? You you throw it out first, and I'll give my reasoning. Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, so... Not from a personality standpoint, obviously, like polar opposites. <laughs> like Kawhi is very much reserved, no emotion. Dub is very much tap into the crowd, scream, yell. Um, I don't know. There, there's something about there's a lot of superstars in the league today and historically that scored a lot of points and put up a lot of numbers on inefficient shooting and inflated numbers because they were just like going out there and like being the guy. There's very few players that can be ultra efficient, do it when it matters most, and play on both sides of the ball. Not just like be a, a decent defender, but like all NBA defender caliber type guy at some point in their career. And that's dub. Like the 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 strength, the like build, the mid range game, the like everything about those two. Like, I'm not saying he's the next Kawhi because Kawhi has won championships on two different teams, which is like almost unheard of. Winning it on a third team with the Clippers would be like actually unheard of. But a lot of the traits that Dub has are very similar to Kawhi from an on court perspective. Nothing the same personality or off the court. But it, it's, it's to me, it's too similar to not at least mention. I love it. Love it. Let's take a break. On the other side, we will hit our predictions for the week before we get out of here. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. And we are back. Uh, no Justin on the show tonight, so we did not have a graphic if you're tuning into the YouTube stream of the updated standings, but I have the updated standings in front of me, and I will read them for you now. In first place, with a uh, a putrid week by my <laughs> own standards, uh, I came into this week with 49 points, and I am leaving the week, folks, with 49 points. I went 2-2, two and two, missed my money ball with that stupid Rockets game. In second yep. place, closing the gap would be one Nicholas Crane. Nick went three and one and hit his money ball with that Pelicans win. Nick is at 46. Nick, you're three points behind me with two weeks to go. It's going to be a photo finish. Right behind Nick is JD, who also had a three and one week and is at 45 points. Then Taylor, who went three and one, has 42. 
Not lastly, last. Lastly, Justin <laughs> went two and two, but missed his money ball. Justin has 40 points. We got four more games on tap this week, gentlemen. Nick, we're going to start with you with the first of the nationally televised games. Tuesday night, they go to the Philadelphia 76ers. Joel Embiid, I do not think, is going to play. I don't think he's ready yet. Um, did Philly play today, Sunday? Mm, I will look. Was whichever game, today or tomorrow, Tyrese Maxey is questionable. Um, they did, and they beat the Raptors 135-120. to 120. Did, uh, did Tyrese Maxey play? I do not believe so. I will check that quickly. So he did Tyrese, not. He did not. So Tyrese might be a uh, a game time decision. Nick, what are you going with the game in the city of brotherly love? Um, I went with a loss. This is probably the hardest one of the week for me. Um, for the for the reasons you described, like no Embiid likely, Maxi's up in the air. Like it seems like a game Oklahoma City should win. Um, I don't know if Shea plays. I, I alluded to this 20 minutes ago or so on the show that I don't think Shea plays the final two back-to-backs this season, at least like both games of the back-to-backs. The Thunder has two more back-to-backs this season. Um, I would imagine um, the team would rather rest him the front night of this one against Philly and then play him against the Celtics the second night versus the inverse, which I think most people would expect for a lot of back-to-backs. So... I think no Shea against the Sixers. I think it's a game they should still win without Shea, to be clear, even if Maxi does play. But they're they're not a bad team. Like they're eighth in the East. They've really struggled with that Embiid, but they're not bad at home. Like twenty one and sixteen at home. That's that's a team that just feels like on the road is a tough out. So I took a loss. Taylor? Also to be different because I think Jacob's taking a win. <laughs> I have to make some ground. That's fair. I also had, or not also, I uh, assuming Jacob has a win, I also have a win against the Sixers. Uh, you kind of mentioned it's a game the Thunder should win, even without Shea, honestly. I think I'm very confident the way that Josh and Dub uh, were playing together when Shea's not playing or when he's not playing well. So I have a win against the Sixers on the first night of the back-to-back. I also took a win against the Sixers, so Nick and I are different there. Uh, JD took a win, and Justin took a win against the Sixers. The following night, they play on a Sega Baba at the Boston Celtics. Uh, I'm going to save everybody some time here because that is L's across the board, folks. Boom. We all took losses. It's going to be a tough game. Which means they'll win. Yeah. Yes. Probably correct. Or if they were named the Atlanta Hawks, they would win. Mm -hmm. Because apparently Boston (laughs) cannot beat the Atlanta Hawks. At the Pacers Friday night during the uncontested watch party at Dave's Hot Chicken, Taylor, what do you got Friday? W. If they lose against the Celtics, this team always seems to respond well off of losses. I'm taking the W against the Pacers for the watch party. I love it. I also went a dub at the watch party because you got to go a dub at the watch party. Nick, what do you got? Yeah, there's no way to lose for the watch party. Uh, I think that Indiana is a pretty simple team to dissect if, if you can defend in any capacity or score in any capacity because Indiana can score a lot but cannot defend at all. You kind of dictate the result of the game. So either D up a bit or outscore them. And that I seems like super it. simple, but it's it is what it is with Indiana. Like it's 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 that easy. JD and Justin both also took a W on this one. The last one next Sunday night before the pod, the Thunder play a revenge game with the Hornets. I call it a revenge game because Poku, Trey Man, Vasily Michik, and Michich and Davis Bertans. We'll be out for blood, folks. The Poku Chet matchup is what I have dreams and or nightmares about. I'll make this one real quick for everybody as well. JD can insert a massive bell ding here because this oh is boy. money balled across the board, folks. Dang. We all played it. It doesn't actually matter, this does one it? It worries me a little bit. It doesn't matter. It's it's literally a zero for everybody. True. Yes. So the only place where um, Nick can gain ground on me this week is Tuesday night. So that'll be a big one. One to one to keep an eye on, Nick. <laughs> It'll be fun. Before we get out of here, and at a later podcast, we'll definitely dive into this a little bit deeper. But when I get everybody's, when I say everybody, you two, 
quick opinions on end of season awards. So I'm going to list an award. We're just going to kind of rapid fire this one. Yeah. Uh, you tell me who wins the award. Let's start at the top. MVP. <sighs> Jalen Brunson. I'm kidding. Kidding. It's got to be Jokic. Yeah. Uh, Jokic for sure. I think Luke is making a little run, but true. He was good. awesome tonight against the Rockets. Crazy. Yeah, I will also go Jokic defensive player of the year. As much as I hate Rudy Gobert. <laughs> yeah. He's like minus 1200 in Vegas. It's like probably not close, but Victor let's, let's have some parody. Let a rookie win the award. He's been good. I'm He's going Rudy as well, awesome. though. He's the anchor of the number one defense in the league. He's going to get yeah. it. Yeah. Six man of year. Mine's another boring one. Malik Monk. It's just been insane here since post all-star break. He's hurt now, though, so that puts a little bit of a wrinkle into things. Give me... I can only say his name the way that the Thunder announcer does because he kills the Thunder every time he comes here. Nas Reed. <laughs> That would I be mean, always says his I name in the most one. bland way. Nas. Yes. Nas Reed. Nas is awesome. Um, I mean, I'm probably going Malik as well. Yeah. Coach of the year. It's a runaway. I it is a runaway. So Give it the Dags, baby. It's, it's, it's yeah. really a runaway, actually. It really is. What are the odds on it? I think it I think Mark's like minus six hundred, which is significant. Good for yeah. him, man. He deserves yeah. it. He's been awesome. The LeBron uh, do we, hype do we, certainly. Do we really need well. to talk rookie of the year? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Wimby's been absolutely absurd. Absurd. It, it's definitely Wimby. Here's a fun one. I don't think it's um position bound anymore. I don't know. Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. Which one uh, first team first team all rookie. Oh no. I mm. I don't think it's position I, feel, I think it's just I five. I think it's Zach five. Lowe mentioned that. He's just five. So um, Wimby Chet, obviously. Brandon Miller. Brandon, Brandon Miller. Miller is another probably okay. obvious one. Hame. Yep, that's the other one I was going to mention. Hame Hawkes. Yeah. I actually had an argument about this with somebody the other day. Uh, they think that Amin Thompson is five and it's a lock. Like that that group of five is already locked. So. I think that I don't Derek think it's a lock. has a case. I think that Keontae George has a case. Keontae and I would well, also would you throw say Amin and Keontae? That's your two? Brandon no, there's Jensen. only one spot left. I know, We're but talking. those are the two guys fighting for it. Was a men and Keontae? I, I said a men, Keontae, Derek Lively. Oh, oh Lively's okay. a great one, also. I forgot about Lively. That might be it, but I want to throw a uh, Pajemski out there as yeah. well, just as an honorable mention. Yeah. Does Queso Obviously, second make team. second team? Yes. Let me pull up. I'm just going to, like, not that Vegas knows everything, but they're generally pretty right. Onto something. On, yeah. Onto something. So. This is not a direct indicator, but NBA Rookie of the Year odds. I'm just going to give you the guys. Wimby's one, Chet's two. Um, other names that are in the conversation that we have not talked about already. Uh, Sar Thompson. Koulibaly, who his season was cut short. Marcus Sasser, Jordan Hawkins. Cam Whitmore, who has been hurt recently, but was awesome when he wasn't. Um, Jairus Walker. Like there, There's a lot of guys that Bye. I think... Deserve yeah. second team. Kaysen, like watching him every night, I think 100%. And if I knew that every voter watched every game for every team all year, I think Kaysen would be second team. But if the you stats don't, don't watch jump every off, game, but the, I think the longevity has to count for something, right? Yeah. But if you look at six points and two rebounds, like it's not the sexiest stat line. And I don't trust voters watching the Thunder every night. I that that's totally has Jarris played enough though to get that nod over a player like Kaysen? Like I don't yeah, if you're a voter so. and you've watched more Jarris than Kaysen, maybe. Like, I, that's, I, that's always the thing. I, I think the gap is too big between Chet and Wemby for this to be an argument. But I think for Kaysen on second team all rookie, it's definitely an argument. A star played a lot of minutes for a absolute shit tier team. Kaysen's playing a lot of minutes and earning minutes on a team that has massive postseason aspirations. A team yep. that could end number one in the West. Six man. Like played six both minutes. Yes. Legitimately. Like that has to mean something. It does. But you would think. To Nick's point. The it's uh it's all depends on the voters. And who who really trusts an electorate? Really? I mean <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. This was a wonderful show. 
Hey, speaking of a wonderful show, the Thunder currently number one in the West. They're half game up Boom. on the Nuggets, full game up on the Minnesota Timberwolves, who lost to the Chicago Bulls tonight. Control their own destiny, baby. They can make it. We've got a full week planned for you guys. Uh, no pod Tuesday after the Philadelphia game, but we will be here Wednesday after the Boston game. The live show watch party Friday night, and then back here Sunday as always as we are gearing up. It is in an hour and 45 minutes. It is playoff month, baby. We have made it. Damn. The end of the regular season is almost here, and we will have so much content for you, so many cool things planned for the postseason. A lot so, of exciting news coming up. Yes. Hang out with us. Enjoy it. We will see you guys Wednesday night. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you, uh, like I said, Wednesday night. Until then, and as always, thunder up. <laughs>